just thank the Lord before we begin to sing. Lord, we do thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for another day that you gave us life, and Lord, you give us the very breath that we breathe, and so we depend completely and totally on you, and we're so glad that we can, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that even though there might be questions in our lives right now, um, Lord, that you have the answer, that you are the answer, and all you ask us to do is trust in you. Lord, I pray for those who aren't here today, uh, those who are vacationing, we pray that they will get the rest um, that they are needing and that they'll enjoy um, the sights around them and the family time. We pray for those who might not be here because of illness, Lord, or any other reason that would keep them, Lord, that, that there's trouble in their life, Lord. We do lift them up today and ask you to reach down where they are right now and touch them in the way that they need it, Lord. And, and also for those of us who are here, Lord, you know the many needs represented, Lord. You know us. Uh, you, you know where we're at in our lives. And um, so we pray, God, that you'll, in, in your own way, um, touch each one of us, Lord, individually today as we enjoy this service together. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Let's continue, and we're going to look at hymn number 476. This is another great hymn of the church that we love to sing here. It's our testimony. We're going to be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Hmm. Good for us. Okay. <laughs>
you were up here with us when you were oh, singing you bass. Yes. So that's why I called you up because you wanted to introduce this next hymn. Oh, yeah. Hymn. Okay. The, <laughs> I'm not getting senile or anything. I, I'm just enjoying the hymns. Becky has uh, the next song is I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. And if you look, if you're holding your hymn book and you look at the author, the writer, it's a gentleman named Ira Stanfill. How many ever heard of Ira Stanfill? Oh, we became friends. We did some camp meetings with him. He's, he's gone now for probably 10 or 12 years. But our, uh, just his story is so, so fitting because Ira was an evangelist, a preacher, and then his marriage fell apart and uh, his wife ran off. And through all of that, he, he just went into a real deep hole, kind of, and discouraged and, and uh, didn't know how to handle it, what to do. And, and through that time, he wrote some of the most beautiful ministry songs that are in the hymn book. Songs like, He Washed My Eyes With Tears That I Might See. Songs like, You Can Have a Song in Your Heart in the night when it's aching, even breaking. Anyone can sing when the sun's shining bright, but he can give you a song in your heart at night. That's Ira Stanfield's heart coming out in his music and, and many, many uh, of his songs have been sung. Some were more joyful. I've got a mansion over the hilltop is one of his well-known songs. And uh, this one here, came from his, uh, again, during, during that time of discouragement and even depression, thinking about tomorrow, wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. He put these words together that have blessed many, many, many people, and uh, me as well. When we were singing, our quartet was singing, we, we recorded this song actually two times because the message is so encouraging today. And I just thought if you know a little bit about Ira Stanfield's background and how God pulled him out of that to rejoicing and, and uh, writing some wonderful song after, songs after that that were very, very uplifting. I remember in a camp, camp meeting, youth camp, I was there as a late, in my late teens and Ira Stanfield was the speaker. And he used to write songs on the spot. And I remember him asking somebody to just throw me a title and I'll write a song. Mm. And, uh, and he did. Somebody hollered out, happiness is the Lord. And he wrote that chorus, happiness is to know this. How many ever heard that before? Yeah, he wrote it just, just on the spot like that. So he was a very gifted man, but a very, very uh, delivered man from depression and uh, heartache. And because of that, we can have great, great ministry. So I just thought you need to hear a little bit about the background uh, of this song. And uh, I hope it will bless your heart. It's hymn That's number 301 if you're using your
here for a couple of days. Becky and Marie and I traveled for almost five years as a, a singing team all over the country, called it the Eastman Family Singers, taking the name from my quartet days. And so we thought while Marie is here, she was here speaking at a camp in Philadelphia for Cairn University and uh, spent a few more days to be with us. And so we enlisted her to join us today uh, to go back a couple of years to, to our singing days. And uh, so if you want to go out now and just take a break, that's okay. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're going we're gonna to just enjoy ourselves for a couple of minutes here with some of the songs that we used to sing. This is so cozy. Thank you for joining me over here. Yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah. What are we doing? <laughs> what are we going to sing, Becky? This song is one we did on our, also on our Family Worship Center CD, the first one we did. I, I would have to say, out of all the hymns of the church that have moved me, and many have, we did it as well with my soul, and that, the story of that hymn just is, is so stirring. Uh, this one is not as familiar a story, but, and I may have shared it here already before, but uh, it was written back toward the end of the last century. It was written because of a terrible um, accident that happened off the coast of Cleveland in, in Lake Erie. And it was, it was written because of a, a, a songwriter was heard the news report. Well, here's what happened. There, there's a lighthouse there. And the lighthouse keeper that night had a real bad storm. And so he figures ice and everything else, he figured, well, no, no big ships will be out there tonight, so I'll just, I'll just light the lighthouse, but I won't light the lights along the shore because they need to be lit because of the ship has to see where the rocks are. And he was, it was cold, and he said, I don't want to waste my time to do that. And, uh, and that ship that was coming in that night looking for the lights along the shore crashed and many people lost their lives and and the writer and I'm trying to remember who it was but it was a familiar songwriter Bliss I think P. P. Bliss heard that story and he wrote this song he he, he uh, the application was that we as believers have a responsibility Jesus is the lighthouse amen he's the light of the world 
But Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are lights as well. Let your light shine. Not wine, but shine. That men may see your good works and glorify your Father, Father in heaven. So every one of us can relate to this and a reminder that our light should be shining. So I hope it'll bless your heart. Lower lights. Like babies, our Father's mercy from the lighthouse song, one of my favorites that Bill wrote, wish I'd have wrote, written it, but uh, it talks about the true freedom that we can have. We live in a free country, but in many cases there are freedoms that are, have been taken away and freedoms that are threatened right now. But he who the Son of God says free is free. Are you free today? I hope you are this morning. So long I had searched for my sweet and slain by the world and my greed and the door. Oh, 
kind of feel it in my soul. We're not saved by feeling, we're saved by faith. And we walk by faith and not by sight. But without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. So thank God for the faith that we can have in him today. I want to speak to you for a few moments, a message entitled, Made Alive for a Purpose made alive for a purpose. When we come to Christ, we take on a new life. Life changes for us. And there's a reason that we're made alive. And I just want to share with you some of the responsibilities that we have as believers today. Made alive for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And you, he made alive, who were dead. You've been resurrected from dead, being dead in trespasses and sins, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked. That's past tense. Aren't you glad it's past tense? Hallelujah. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. I've been fascinated recently by the word quickened. I was studying that and uh, it's, it's uh, in the King James Version, it says, quickened, made alive. It's the opposite of being dead. I've been around a lot of deadness when it comes to spiritual things. But to be quickened is to be made, to be made alive. And the reason that we're made alive is for a purpose. And I want to talk to you about that purpose today to get a basic understanding of the life that we have in Christ or the new birth, I think the first uh, character that we could look at is, is Nicodemus. Nicodemus 
who came to Jesus one night. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, the Bible says. He was a member of the Sanhedrin and uh, definitely lived by the law that definitely knew nothing about a new life that Christ had brought to, to him or had brought to the earth. And he asked a question to Jesus. He came at night. He didn't want to be seen. I can almost picture that um, approaching Jesus on the on the top of the house in those days, and they still do today. The houses are flat roofed, most of them, in, in the Middle East. And he came up on that, that roof top, and he asked Jesus some questions. He said, what must I do to be saved? Songwriters have written about that pretty often. Stuart Hamlin wrote a song called, You Must Be Born Again. And he talks about old Nicodemus come calling to seek the Lord one night. And he said, Master, something's wrong with me. My heart's not feeling right. And Jesus said, you'll never change that feeling, son. The master did reply, you'll only know the answer when you've been born again. What does that mean? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to come alive? I know I need something. And Jesus told him very clearly, you have to be born again. And I have to ask you a question today. What, what does that mean to you, those words, born again? If you poll 100 people, you might get a few to agree together of what it means. But many would have their own opinion. Many churches have their own way of saying it. But one thing we do know, being born again is a very personal experience. Being born is personal, is it not? Being born in the natural is personal. Being born again is a very personal experience. I can't be saved because my father was, or my brother, or my mother, or my sister. I can't be ready to meet the Lord on their salvation. It's a personal experience experience. I remember hearing a message saying, God doesn't have any grandchildren. And I realized that meant me. I thought I was okay. Family plan stuff. But no, it's a personal experience. Nicodemus understood that very well. It's much more than a feeling. Many people at one time or another have experienced religion. They've experienced a, a good feeling. They've experienced a religious experience. On special days like Easter and Christmas, Mother's Day, Memorial Day, feeling is high. Religious feeling is, is high in, in the world. I mean, someone said one time, even, even Jewish cash registers play at O Little Town of Bethlehem at Christmas. I mean, it's religion, religious feeling is high. During revivals, during crusades, during religious concerts, watching videos. I mean, crowds come forward in these mega, mega crusades. They, they shake hands, they sign a card, they repeat a prayer, they cry. And sometimes they join the church and they make a turnaround. Decisions are counted and recorded and rejoiced about and it's wonderful and the cost is not important it's worth the price but when it all boils down to where the rubber meets the road are they genuinely born again has the old life died out and a new life come does the experience live up to the text that I read to you today are you made alive by the great love with which he loved us. That's the question I want to ask you today. Jesus said to Nicodemus, and he's talking to a, a scholar, he's talking to a very well-educated man. Nicodemus was in advanced studies for sure. He was in graduate school perhaps by our standards, but the language that Jesus used wasn't part of what the church taught him. It was a foreign language to Nicodemus to hear Jesus say, except the man be born again. 
That experience was not required in his religious background. And many churches today don't know how to handle that word or that experience. But Nicodemus knew that he needed something or someone. And he came to the right place. He needed to know more. And he acknowledged Jesus and he credited Jesus. He said in verse two of John chapter three, I know that you're a teacher sent from God. That's a, that's a very great confession. He wanted to know God. He wanted to sense the presence of God. And here's what he said. No man can do these miracles unless God is with him. So he was honoring Jesus and acknowledging his power. And he went from a religion to a desire to taste reality. How are you doing with that today? Are you enjoying reality in Christ? The acknowledgement of Jesus brings a supernatural beginning, a new beginning, a quickening. It's another the King James word for coming alive. When a person is born again, he sees, he hears, he feels what he never saw, never felt, never heard, or definitely never understood before. The new birth is a life-changing experience. Amen, JR, that's the truth. I mean, I know they know that, but it is a life-changing experience to be born again. I want you to evaluate your own life today while we're talking. There's a change in perspective. You see things differently. You, you, there's a change in your eyesight, so to speak. You become, you become far-sighted in the sense that you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You don't get it. It doesn't become real to you unless you're born again. And that's where 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which is so familiar. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what happens when you're born again. And you have to evaluate that, evaluate that in your own life. Old things pass away because the new has come. Your former senses, your former desires, your, your former habits fall away. You become alive and you see the world through different eyes. That's what the, the word of our text says. You have, he has made you alive. You were dead. You walked in sin, obeying the suggestions of the God of this world, of the prince of the power of the air, of Satan. Your lifestyle was totally in the flesh and your mind because we are by nature sinners. Some will argue about that, but we are by nature sinners. In other words, it's not by accident. It's not by environment. It's not by heredity. It's not by force. For years, experts have told us that people are products of poverty, of discrimination, of unemployment. They told us that society, not the person, is at fault and we need to change society and that'll change people's hearts. But the word of God confronts that straight on. That is a lie, that's not true. We are by nature sinners. We are responsible for our own actions. Passing the buck doesn't work in Christianity, the old spiritual, not my father nor my mother, but it's me, O oh Lord. The, the uh, five blind boys from Alabama, great, great. They're very, very old now, but a great singing group. And I, I love one of their songs. It says, ain't nobody's fault but mine. If I don't pray, it's not my mom's fault. It's my fault. If I don't read the Bible, it's not my mom's fault, it's my fault. It ain't nobody's fault but, my, but mine. We are responsible for our own actions. We choose to sin. If we're given a choice 
Many times we lean strongly toward the dark side, toward sin. And it's, it's a shame, but we see it, if ever we've seen it uh, experienced or, or displayed, it's in the last few weeks in our country and around the world. Violence, murder, death. People choose that. Uprising. I, I mean, you know, I don't need to get into that. It's, it's, so, it's so troublesome today even to watch the news. Here's what I feel, and I hope that, that as a nation and as individuals, as a church, that we, we come to the place where with compassion and sensitivity we meet people where their, where their needs are. That we are a compassionate, sensitive church and individuals meet them at the point of their need. We have to stand firmly on this, the, the lessons, the teaching, the standards, if I can use that word today, put forth by the word of God. It's time to call wrong, wrong, and what right, right. It's time, it's time to tell the truth in love, but it's time to just be, declare the truth. And, and as believers individually, it doesn't all have to come from the pulpit or from the radio, from the television. It has to come for us individually. And when we come alive, when we are quickened, then we, we have a, a, great sense, a greater sensitivity to the need. The word quickened is descriptive. It's descriptive. Christ is the only one in history that could claim to be life. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word came, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. He gives us life. We are made alive in Christ. So Nicodemus came to the source of light and life. He was troubled. His religion was not making it. And so he came to Jesus. Now, does the Bible say Nicodemus was born again that night. He had a lot of questions. Couldn't understand that term. But let me tell you why I know that Nicodemus went from being a secret disciple to publicly standing up and being counted as a follower of Jesus. After Jesus died, he was hanging on the cross and Nicodemus had a friend named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a rich man. He had an unused grave. Probably had it dug for himself down the road. I don't know. But he was prepared with his funeral plot. And the Bible says Joseph and Nicodemus came to retrieve the body of Christ from the cross. In other words, he went from being in the shadows to very public at the risk, I'm sure, of his reputation and his position with the Sanhedrin. But he became a brand new person because he came to Jesus with an honest question. And he became alive. And he was re released from the death of religion. To be born again to, means to be saved from a meaningless bondage. Saved by Christ. Saved is a good word. I'm saved. And I know that I, I got gospel music in me today. I'm sorry. It's a good word. Sin wastes. Sin is a waste. Sin wastes. Sin is a lie. Sin destroys any good in me. Another song that I love says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. 
And if we had time to, to ask for testimonies today, you'd hear people stand up and tell you how they broke free from that life of sin and became a new creation. Alcohol was gone. Drugs were gone. Pornography, which was a, a horrible addiction, was gone because Jesus came in and changed them. It's more than being reformed or rehabilitated. We are by nature born in sin. And so the seed is in, the, in me. The old nature in me cannot produce what needs to grow in me. Let me identify with uh, the Apostle Paul here. In Romans chapter 7, verses 21, 24, and 25. I find then a law that evil is present with me. I'm the one who wills to do good, but evil is present with me. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body, this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with a mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh I'm tempted I, I, to, to serve the law of sin. But who can deliver me? Hallelujah. Only Jesus can deliver me. Paul's being very candid there in his personal testimony. Jesus is very clear in John chapter 3 and, and verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. He's telling this to Nicodemus. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's only Jesus and Nicodemus on that rooftop. Nicodemus was the first one that heard, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The golden text of scripture Jesus gave to a Sanhedrin leader, a religious leader, because he was hungry. He was searching. And when you come to Jesus hungry and searching and starving to death, he'll give you life. He'll give you food to eat. That which is born of flesh is flesh. It can't change. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There has to be a change of nature. You may, may disagree with this, and that's okay. If you disagree, and you come up and apologize, I'll forgive you. We must be recognizable as a new man or a new woman. Unless there is a visible change, there is really no new birth. Now, I don't mean instantly. Things drop off gradually. But there has to be a change. There has to be a difference. I ain't what I used to be, thank God. I think you need to be recognizable. And the easiest way to do that is follow the scripture direction and, and share your faith. Tell somebody. Guess what happened to me at church last week? You'll have their ear, I tell you that. Can I tell you what happened to me? Can I tell, a good question to ask is to a person, are you a believer? Let me tell you how I became a believer. And I think more and more we need to be thinking that way. If you're not uh, in tune with what's happening globally, uh, you're not in tune with the word of God. The things that are happening these days are in some ways very scary and uh, in, other way, words, in other ways very exciting because it tells us that Jesus is coming soon. We are not captured or forced. Jesus takes no prisoners. The Holy Spirit doesn't stalk you counts on you when, when you're not looking, but he draws you to the Father. And that's when that quickening comes. The pastor, the evangelist, the church, your parents can't make you move to him. The Bible says that Nicodemus made a choice. He came to Jesus at night. It was voluntary. Of course, and I thank God for this. There's a, a drawing, a conviction. There's a presentation of choices that come, maybe through a song or, or the word or the preaching of the cross. Choices are presented. When you sing, I cherish the old rugged cross, you have to ask yourself, do I? I will cling to the old rugged cross. 
I love the verse that says, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Be careful when you sing that because you're making a statement that might cost you friends, it might cost you uh, persecution, it might cost you uh, comfort sometimes, but I'm telling you, the drawing from the Lord, a conviction, a presentation of the choices, again, through a song or a word or the preaching, the options are there. It's either life or death. Choose life. Don't choose death. The father of lights or the father of lies. That's the choice. Who do you want to serve today? Can I remind you of this? And I think the whole world knows this. And that's why there's so much anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-Christ, anti-church on this planet. Because Jesus is too big to be ignored. And the people in the Middle East that are giving their lives because they're Christians. Their lives are taken strictly because they're Christians. Jesus is not a myth. He is an offense to the world. That's why his name, his book, his word is not welcomed in public. He's real. A real choice. The only choice for life is Jesus. Nicodemus found that out. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Going to church is not the new birth. Please understand that. You have to receive him. You have to receive him personally. Signing a card is not the new birth. Saying you're saved is not the new birth. When you're born again, you become someone. You become a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's somebody. You're fathered by God and you become a new spiritual person. It's an act of God. John 3, 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound. You can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit of God. We have a nature given at birth that must be replaced. So what do you replace it with? 2 Peter 1, 4. We have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of a divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We belong to Jesus. We have a divine nature that's been given to us when we receive him because we've escaped the corruption of the world through Satan's temptations and his tests and his fiery darts and everything he throws at us. We escape that because he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. If I had time today, I can't list all 8,000 promises in the Bible. But I can lift, list some. And one of them is I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a great promise. There's another one that says he has not given us a spirit of fear. But of love and power and a sound mind. That's a promise. One of the favorite promises of people is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all, all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Philippians 4, 8. Anybody know that by heart? Philippians 4, 8. Do you know 4, 6? Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication and Thanksgiving, Make, let your request be made on, known unto the Lord and the peace of God which passes understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is one thing that people more, need more than anything else in these days is the peace of God. Are you at peace? Do you live in, we live in a world that is desperate to see people that are, have peace with God. Show that, reflect that to people. 
How come you're never sad? How come you're never worried? I, hey, I have the peace of God. It's a promise. I'm anxious for nothing. I don't worry about it. But in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to the Lord. These are wonderful promises. You are a son of God. Hallelujah. We belong to Jesus. We've escaped the corruption. There must be that experience in our lives. Saul of Tarsus was born again. He was born again. Listen to him, his story. He was hired by a government agency to stamp out Christians. He hated them. He was a patriot. I mean, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he hated Christians. He was devoted to his nation, a very religious man. He made good marks in religion, but he was dead, dead in trespasses and sins. He needed to be made alive, and I just want to close this part with this testimony of Paul, his personal testimony. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. That has happened to people in services as long as I've been hanging around church people. Suddenly, the lights come on. Sitting there and all of a sudden the Spirit of God chooses you and zaps you with a truth and whoa. And you realize that you've been living a lie or living wrong and following the wrong master. Suddenly, a light shone around him from heaven and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, Saul. Wouldn't that shake you up? Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> At least he acknowledged who he was. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. That's a whole nother sermon. I am Jesus. When you are persecuted, they're not persecuting you. When they're coming against you for your testimony, they're not coming against you. They're coming against Jesus. I am Jesus. It's hard for you to kick against the gold. So he, trembling and astonished, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. What is the lesson of that? The lesson of that is this. Number one, don't take persecution personal. It's your Jesus that makes people uncomfortable. It's Jesus that makes nations uncomfortable. It's Jesus that makes sometimes the Supreme Court uncomfortable. It's Jesus that makes those that are responsible for the education of our children uncomfortable. He's a no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. You can't use that name. But Jesus said, you're persecuting me. When you are born again, your life is redirected and you do what he wants you to do. A born again person puts Jesus first at all times. And I have to tell you this, looking back over my life, it's not optional, it's essential that you put Jesus first. Seek, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. And all these other things will fall in place. Your fear, your doubt, your worry, your faithlessness, your fear about tomorrow, all these things will fall into place if you seek him first. That is a simple solution. I mean, it takes determination, it takes uh, stick to it takes desire, but if you seek him first, ask him of a morning, what do you want me to do today, God? 
Let Satan be upset when you get up in the morning because you're getting your direction from Jesus. If you seek him first, there's no question about that. No argument. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall into place. And when you go home today, read Matthew 6 because he lists all of the things that, that, that he'll take care of if you seek him first. Food, clothing, I mean, lodging, you seek him first and you will never, ever, ever be sorry. It's essential. You must be born again. You must be quickened and made alive in Jesus Christ. And as I said at the beginning and I say at the, at the ending, we are made alive for a purpose. We are made alive for a purpose. Are you fulfilling your purpose? If you need some direction in that area, give me a call this week and we'll talk about how God could use you in many different ways if you surrender to, to him. That's important to know that. Would you stand with me, please? And would you bow your heads? We're going to just close in a word of prayer. But before we do, I want to give you an opportunity today to be like Nicodemus and come to Jesus for new life. Jesus said to him, you, you need to be born of the spirit. That was born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. This, this service has been kind of dedicated to some of the old hymns of the church and gospel music. And I want us to close singing one more. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to invite you to come to this altar today if you've been stirred by the word and the spirit of God is saying, hey, have you been born again? Have you made Jesus first in your life? And if the answer is, I'm not sure or no, then you need to do that before you leave this room today. So as we sing, just as I am without one plea, I want you to just step out from where you are. Nobody will condemn you. Someone may even come with you and we'll pray about it and help you to surrender your life to Christ today. Just as I am without, oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus didn't try any gimmicks on Nicodemus. He just told him the truth. He answered his question, what must I do to be saved? There's no secret to it. It's just a surrender to the Lord. And I pray that if you're here today and you've never really surrendered to Jesus, been a long time, you even thought about it, before you sleep tonight, I pray that the Holy Spirit will hound you, make you uncomfortable until you say yes to Jesus. 
Father, bless us as we go. Keep us safe this day. Use us, make us a blessing. And thank you for meeting the need in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go with God. Have a wonderful day today.